Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. We're very pleased to have today uh, Professor Ted Sargent of Northwestern University. I'm Sang Kim, head of uh, Chemical Engineering School. And uh, this uh, Distinguished Lecture is host, co-hosted by the School of Chemical Engineering and the College of Engineering. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, first announce, I've been asked to announce that there is an overflow room uh, in the Forney G140, the large auditorium. So if you would like to be seated while you're watching the uh, lecture, uh, you can also do that from Forney Hall as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Interim Dean of Engineering, uh, Mark Lundstrom, to the stage. Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Singh. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our first Purdue Distinguished Lecture of Fall 2022. So since 2018, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series has brought thought leaders in academia and business to campus to discuss the grand challenges and opportunities in their field. And today we are pleased to welcome Professor Ted Sargent. Uh, Professor Sargent's lecture, How Can Research in Solar Energy Harvesting and Electrified Chemical Synthesis Contribute to Defossilization? His lecture will set the stage for a panel discussion. Professor Sargent is the Lynn Hopkin Davis and Greg Davis Professor of, at Northwestern University with appointments in the Department of Chemistry and Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Before joining Northwestern about a year ago, uh, he was University Professor at the University of Toronto and also held the Canada Research Chair in Nanotechnology. Professor Sargent's work to unite chemistry, physics, and engineering has attracted wide attention. As one example, his publications on these topics have been cited more than 100,000 times. As an electrical engineer myself, who stayed in his own discipline, but who has collaborated with several chemists and chemical engineers, I know what a special person it takes to work across these disciplines, and I know how special their contributions are. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Ted Sargent. Welcome. Well, thank you. It is wonderful to be at uh, Purdue, and it's really gratifying to see such a nice crowd gathered today. I'm so pleased that uh, it's such a nice uh, audience with us today. Um, you know, as you were preparing for today's event and were tweeting about the fact that I was coming, I was really gratified to see that I got maybe 60 or 70 or 80 likes and retweets on the tweet that Latan sent out. And that might have been the largest number of tweets and retweets I'd ever seen regarding anything I was involved in. And then just yesterday, I saw a tweet of a man on a bicycle um, with a baby capybara in his little container on the front of the bicycle in Berlin. And just in a single day, he had accumulated something like 8,000 tweets or something like that. So it gave me a sense of perspective, which is always helpful. Um, yeah, so I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm going to talk in kind of two chapters. The first about finding ways to generate more low-carbon electricity and trying to really accelerate our path towards more low-carbon electricity. And then the second one, I'm going to ask, what should we do with it? So what should we do with what I hope will be an abundance of available and low-cost electricity that has a low-carbon footprint. So on my first topic, uh, and I suppose this kind of covers both, I'll first just acknowledge that while we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint, we're going to do it in the context of a huge amount of economic growth, and inevitably with economic growth comes energy consumption growth. So this isn't just a problem of uh, finding ways to generate the same amount of electricity uh, in novel ways. This is actually uh, uh, a challenge of producing considerably more energy to meet growing demand and to eventually zero out our net carbon emissions. So this is a really big grand challenge. Uh, in fact, the ethical imperative of doing this and doing this well is even more obvious when you look at the fact that the growth is coming from non-OECD nations. So it's coming in parts of the world where, if we succeed, we'll be continuing to help in the advancement of quality of life, which again is necessarily accompanied by growth in energy consumption. 
So this is actually a really important societal challenge that we're embarking with, and we need to meet this societal obligation in a way that is coherent with, obviously, our climate obligations as a people. You, of course, know well about where some of these climate imperatives come from. It's the fact that with CO2 now exceeding 400 ppm in the atmosphere, we are making this significant contribution to global warming and that it is having all sorts of uh, impacts and it's even having greater impacts on the people who can least afford to suffer from those impacts. Now, when you look at our plans and our pledges, you'll see that the world community has made progress in articulating pathways to reduce net CO2 emissions. My vertical axis here is gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So you'll see that where we are now is around 40. And we aspire to moving towards a net zero scenario by 2050, but existing pledges and available technologies don't get us there. Now, you could think of that as frightening, and I would encourage you to do so, but if you're somebody who's doing an undergraduate degree in engineering or a graduate degree or a postdoc in engineering or the physical sciences, you could think of it as bracing, that we're at the heart of solving this huge societal and global challenge. Uh, in fact, if you're somebody who's interested in making money, you could also think of this as a big challenge because when you think of the size of the global energy industry today, roughly $5 trillion, depending on how you count, um, this is inevitably going to be displaced by low carbon solutions over the coming two decades, which actually isn't all that long. I mean, it's maybe the first half of some of your professional careers. So we will have figured out this problem, and there's $5 trillion a year in new classes of energy revenue to be created per year, $5 trillion per year. So it is a big problem, but it's going to have huge potential, it has huge potential for individuals like folks in this room, but also if you think of for nations, uh, if certain nations get there first and are able to be right at the vanguard of the science and the engineering and the application of the translation of these technologies, then their economic benefits will be tremendous as well. So specifically, where do we need to make impacts in order to move in the direction of net zero? Well, the simple answer is everywhere, and there are probably things on this list that aren't the things that you're thinking about, like behavior and avoided demand. You may not be thinking about the fact that we can create incentives and we can use behavioral economics in order to try to drive down a component of demand where that demand can be reduced. Uh, energy efficiency, there's technology opportunities here, there's also utilization opportunities as well. Hydrogen uh, has to be a major part of this equation uh, industrial hydrogen is already a big uh, component associated with CO2 emissions, and we have reasonably mature technologies to address this, and now we need to scale those and make them even more mature. Um, we need to bring online a huge amount, this is the green, the light green downward arrows, of wind and solar. And in order to do that, we need to reduce any friction related to the adoption of these technologies. These frictions can include the fact that in parts of the world, it's still too expensive to use these sources. That everywhere in the world, these intermittent sources need storage if they're really gonna become part of a robust solution. Um, there are rare materials inside some of these technologies, and so there are opportunities to think about where we will find those materials or where we can replace them with alternatives. And then the last part of my talk today is gonna to concern the orange rectangle, which is carbon capture and utilization, which is going to be a requirement Given that some of these sources of CO2 emission are hard to abate, it's going to be a requirement to get us the rest of the way to net zero. But I'm going to start with some of the interesting challenges in the area of producing more low carbon electricity from the sun. And here I just want to mention first that the sun is a very, very generous resource. Uh, if you were to compare the amount of solar energy hitting the earth in a year, which is my big yellow cube, it is huge compared to the total proven reserves of coal. So we have no excuses from a sort of fundamental perspective in terms of the energy flux that's arriving on the Earth. But obviously this is a distributed resource. It's spread out in area. And so our challenge is to find ways to be efficient enough in capturing what energy there is and cost-effective enough 
in order to start to take on a significant portion of our energy supply from this kind of source. Now, there are very ambitious projections for how much this sector needs to scale. But in order for this sector to scale in the ways that meet even just its portion of the decarbonization challenge, there's a huge amount of work that has to be done to further reduce the, actually the energy intensity, the capital intensity, and the cost of producing electricity from solar sources. Now what's amazing is that empirically, there's actually been a, an impressive downward tick in the cost of solar cells and of solar modules. And this uptick in the growth of utilization of solar that's just happened in the last five or 10 years is directly connected with that. But if you look underneath it, it looks like this may be a downward tick that we can only get once. It's related to a learning curve traced to the manufacturing technology of these solar solutions. And so you see here that there's been this dramatic decline in what's called the per piece learning. So this is a learning curve component that is related to better understanding the scaled manufacturing of these solar cells. And it's been great. It's had a huge and rapid impact. But the impact coming from improving energy efficiency has been more limited. And many of us have come to believe that we need another step change in the efficiency of these solar cells to make a further striking downward tick to further increase adoption of solar technologies. Now this is an eye chart, and I apologize for it. And you don't need to absorb at all everything on this eye chart. The general trend here that we're looking at is that over decades, solar technologies from their inception took a while to improve in performance. There was a lot of deep science, of deep engineering, semiconductors, interfaces, crystal growth, materials processing, um, but that these have substantially saturated. They're coming to within about 80% of the thermodynamic limit of how well a solar cell based on one absorber so based on one choice of semiconductor composition, can do. Now then something happened uh, about a decade ago that really took the world by storm in solar, which is a new class of materials, perovskites. Perovskite crystals have been around and understood for a long time, but a particular subclass of this crystal class called organometal halide perovskites, but for obvious reasons, I'm just gonna call them perovskites for the rest of the talk. These came on the scene in a decade, they caught up in performance to what had taken five decades to achieve. And then more strikingly, recently, when you combine them with silicon, they've started to overtake the legacy technologies. So this has really gotten people interesting. So what are these perovskites up to? Well, the crystal class is ABX3, broadly speaking. And when I said organometal halide perovskites, it was that the X is a halide, sometimes as a mixture of iodide and bromide, or sometimes even some chloride. And these materials are very versatile. That's one striking property. So you can see here I'm showing that they can emit colors of light that span the full rainbow and that even go into the infrared. That ends up being a very powerful idea in making solar cells that can more fully harvest the full solar spectrum. Another thing when we in our group got early into this field, because this is about seven years ago, is that these materials seem to like to be pure. They seem to like to not have sites, defect states within their band gaps where electrons and holes can come together and can recombine and lose energy. But instead, they seem to like to uh, clean their own band gaps and ensure that between the conduction band edge and the valence band edge, there is a very, very low density of what are called deep electronic trap states. And we studied this using some really kind of basic materials growth and photophysics. It's actually the kind of stuff you might have seen at Bell Labs in the 1960s and the 1970s, where we were growing single crystals of these semiconductors in the liquid phase. And using classical spectroscopies to study how clean their band gaps were and got results that even though these, even though these materials were being uh, made around room temperature, they were being made in an open lab, in these single crystals, the trap state density was in the same ballpark as in the semiconductors that we make 
in clean rooms at high temperatures with incredible purity of processing. So there's this kind of hint that what was helping these perovskites succeed in solar was that even though they were made under these rather familiar kind of room ambient conditions, they were producing uh, very clean sets of densities of states. But the other thing they were doing is because they were processable from the liquid phase, you could make this semiconductor into an ink. Well, you could deploy it in all sorts of ways as well. You could spray it. You could do spin coating, which you may not want to do for solar cells, but if you want to integrate a new class of optoelectronic material onto a silicon wafer, you might well want to spin coat it. If you want something patterned, you could inkjet print it. And if you wanted to figure out how to make a solar cell kind of the way you'd print a newspaper, you could doctor blade or roll to roll print it. And so this capacity to make from an ink looked like and still looks like a really powerful way to really scale these things up. In fact, when you envision scale, you know, imagine, imagine an old fashioned uh, newspaper printing process. Many of you out there um, believe that newspapers are, only exist on iPads. But long, long ago before you were born, there were these pieces of paper that could roll very, very quickly and could transfer ink to them. And so this is a very scaled, very low cost per area technology and actually very perfect printing technology. Now what gets really interesting from the efficiency perspective is when you couple these into layered structures where you're no longer limited by that idea that I mentioned before that only one semiconductor junction is active, but where two or three are active. And so the solar cell starts to become a kind of rainbow cell on its own. And then from techno-economic projections, this is where things get interesting from a driving a greater supply of lower cost, low carbon electricity perspective. Folks have modeled how much can we reduce the equivalent cost of electricity from solar when we move to these technologies that are more and more efficient. You see going from the left to the right across here, uh, higher and higher efficiencies. And then in the final one, uh, a reasonably high efficiency, but combined with a really low manufacturing cost. And you'll see here a projection for a further reduction relative to the existing kind of state-of-art silicon technologies being achieved by these projected perovskite performance levels. Now, one of the challenges that's really needed the attention of applied physicists and chemists and engineers of all sorts over the last couple of years is the fact that these perovskites, while promising for performance, are not yet robust enough. And so you can see the, the problem being depicted on the graph on the left, which is that you start this thing operating and then after 350 hours, what looks like a very promising initial efficiency has declined. And what matters if you're going to achieve these, these uh, electricity cost targets, what matters is the average deficiency over a 25 year lifetime. And also what matters is the predictability of that 25 year lifetime, which the solar people call bankability. The ability that you will be able to uh, invest in a solar asset and make money off of it in a robust, predictable way. So this kind of decline in performance is not okay. And so that has led to a lot of activity and a lot of effort in the perovskite field in making more and more robust solar cells. It's also led to a lot of scientific investigation of where these limitations in performance are coming from. So here I'll just highlight some of our work from earlier this year. We made a device that actually flipped upside down the perovskite solar cell architecture. That allowed us to deposit it onto a completely inorganic whole transport material, a nickel oxide whole transport material. And that allowed us to pass one of these reliability tests. There's a bunch of standards that have been established in the solar sector to pass the one that's an accelerated lifetime test, one that occurs at 65 degrees C, and to report the absence of degradation over 1,000 hours. Now you may say 1,000 hours is in 25 years, and indeed it's not. But these accelerated lifetime tests allow us to extrapolate or to project forward for how reliable these technologies will be uh, when we do operate them under more normal conditions for more extended periods of time. In fact, what we really need to do is to build reliability physics models using these accelerated lifetime tests to be able to project and extrapolate. And that's what the field is now starting to do. 
I've mentioned a couple of times this idea that solar performance can be enhanced uh, when we no longer rely on just a single band gap. And I want to explain where that comes from and then where the opportunity to make multiple colors of band gaps derives from. So if you want to look at the solar spectrum, which is the very broad band orange distribution here, spanning, as you can see, the visible, the near infrared, and the short wavelength infrared, if you place the choice of band gap, let's say at 620 nanometers at about two electron volts, as has been done here, well, we'll be able to absorb those colors above that band gap, so to the blue of that, so to the left on this spectrum. But we'll leave aside those that are un unabsorbed. You can see a lot of potential current density that's being left on the table when we place the band gap in this position. Uh, and so you say, well, let's move it all the way over to the right. Let's absorb all of these photons. But then the voltage that this solar cell can deliver will be limited by the value of that energy gap. Another way to say that is that all these juicy energetic photons in the visible are going to very quickly have much of their energy lost to thermalization inside the semiconductor. And so this leads to a compromise if you make a device using a single junction approach. And it leads to this upper bound of a little above 30% for the solar power conversion efficiency. But if you add just even one additional band gap, and then you have to renormalize the first one, so you need to choose these two band gaps optimally, you can extend this limit from, 43%, from 33% to 43%. Uh, and so there's this very striking possibility that becomes available when you do more selective photon harvesting in a tandem device. So in some of our work, we've looked at doing this with silicon solar cells. Now, silicon solar cells actually have this great advantage, which is the beauty of the fact that we can etch silicon along certain crystal planes to make pyramids, which function as anti-reflection coatings. But if you're somebody trying to put a perovskite active layer onto these, one of these rough topologies, it actually comes as a challenge. Uh, and so in this study, we worked with colleagues to first figure out how could we keep the pyramids very optically effective at their anti-reflection job, but also make them compatible with the solution processing of the perovskite active layer. So that was the first optimization, was to find a suitable pyramid size. And then the next step was to build an integrated device with this technology that evenly apportioned the photon current between the silicon, which is what I show on the top right here in the blue, and the perovskites. And it needed to current match. Because these were being connected together in series, we had to equalize their currents and optimize the choice of band gap in the perovskite layer. Uh, and as a result of that, we're able to advance the uh, efficiency of these solar cells uh, by combining the two active layers together. And as you can see here, uh, also achieve an improvement in the sustained performance, so the continuous, reliable operating performance of the devices. One of the areas this is going to now is bifacial solar cells. The legacy approach, the silicon approach, is now not just absorbing the light that's coming in from the top directly from sunlight, such as what's shown on the left image here, but they're also using reflection and backscattering. It could be off of a specially chosen material, or it even could be off of sand, or it could be off of snow. And they're taking in that light from the backside as well. And when they do this, they can achieve an increase in the overall energy harvesting yield that's accomplished. And so the field has moved towards how can we now make tandems of silicon and perovskites or perovskites and perovskites with one another that leave the backside open and transparent and that can still achieve the requisite current matching requirement uh, even as the angle of the sun varies and the spectrum of the sun varies. So a really interesting challenge for engineers. But ultimately what these can do, you know, I talked about yield, which is my vertical axis here. Ultimately what these can do is they can achieve, achieve a relative increase of as much as 30% uh, in the yield to solar energy flux that's accomplished in these tandem solar cells by levering the scattering and reflective properties of the underlying surface that the solar cells are installed upon through these transparent 
back contacts and through the re-optimization of the solar cell itself. And so it's these kinds of strategies that again are bringing us back towards these higher and higher efficiency cells that are lowering the cost. And so for example, in recent periods, we've now started to move towards demonstrating you can play this tandem game just with perovskites, just with ink-based materials. So if you're concerned about the capital cost of building a conventional solar cell factory based on silicon, uh, or if you're trying to start a solar industry in a place that doesn't have one at scale, um, you know, now you've got this printable technology that allows you to go create a next generation solar industry on a much more capital efficient model. So recently we've demonstrated that uh, in collaboration with colleagues, this is with Professor Hiran Tan, that we could achieve the 26% solar power conversion efficiency threshold with one of these uh, two, -termin two, -terminal, two terminal tandem technologies. So to end the first of two chapters in my talk today, I'll just summarize by saying that the, I think the most interesting challenge that still needs our primary attention in the solar materials and technologies field is the efficiency challenge. I think we still have more work to do. And the ways to th tackle the challenge are, uh, are, are many in number. They certainly involve architectures, maybe the regime of electrical engineers and applied physicists traditionally but they involve new materials, designs, and syntheses in materials processing. And so they engage for sure the chemical engineer, but very much also the materials scientists, even the mechanical engineer. And as I'll say a little later in my talk, to try to accelerate the discovery of these materials, they engage the computer scientist and the computer engineer and the data scientist as well. So it's really quite a broad spectrum uh, of research and uh, applied engineering research and R&D uh, topics. Uh, reliability science is gonna be a really important frontier area for this field. And I am choosing my words carefully here. I mean, maybe reliability science sort of sounds better than reliability or durability. But what I really intend is that the only way to get these technologies to have market and climate impact quickly is for us to understand the underlying mechanisms of degradation so we can go remedy them. Or so when, the, when a solar cell dies in the field, uh, we can go tackle the problem, we can tackle it swiftly, and we have a basis in science of how to do that. And for sure, we need to work on scale and paths to further scale by lowering materials and processing costs. All right, so I'm now going to uh, take a sip and change tracks. and move over to the question of what can we do with what we hope will be this ever-increasing abundance of low-carbon electricity. Now, first I'm going to say, you know, when I kind of got into this area, you can imagine, because I'd been working in solar and optoelectronics for a while, you can imagine I might say, well, how can I use my expertise uh, in dealing with photons and semiconductors to go tackle this other problem, which is of taking carbon dioxide and turning that into, say, fuels. Um, but instead, at the time, I really felt strongly that if I was going to go tackle that, I would actually be quite agnostic as to where that electricity came from. If I was really committed to, let's say, making hydrogen or making chemicals or making fuels using this electricity, all I would want is more of it, I'd want it to be low in its carbon footprint, and I'd want it to be as cheap as possible. And so I kind of decoupled these two halves of my research activity and said, here, I would just focus on, once we have this electricity, what can we do with it to try to accelerate climate impact? And so as I was introducing the topic, um, I already pointed out that being able to synthesize using electrical power hydrogen is going to have a huge impact. And being able to capture and utilize CO2 will also be very relevant. And in particular, I had shown in my net zero plot that there are certain sectors that are going to be very hard to decarbonize. Uh, one example that's easy to understand is that, I guess we don't know for sure yet, but it may be hard to figure out how to make airplanes that run either on electricity and batteries or that run on hydrogen, or they are at least accepted uh, as running on those technologies, especially on the hydrogen. So it may be that aviation is going to be a very hard to decarbonize sector. 
And of those you know, fairly limited now, we hope, CO2 emissions that remain, uh, some of those will be kind of eaten up by the things where we don't have alternatives. And so aviation may be an example of that. Uh, and so it's interesting then to ask, are there ways to offset? If those are kind of inevitable emissions, are there ways in which we can offset them? So one potential strategy to do that would actually be to consume CO2 uh, in the course of synthesizing those fuels. So this is that CCUS acronym that I mentioned before. Uh, we have lots of sources of carbon. Some of the ones that are maybe a little bit more short-term imaginable are, say, the emissions from existing factories uh, that have a CO2 footprint and that are at a point source emitting CO2. So we know where it is. We know where we need to attach our carbon capture infrastructure to it. Uh, it's at a reasonably high concentration, which makes it a bit more of a short-term uh, approach. Long-term, and I would even say the subject of controversy, at least the subject of some speculation as to whether we can solve all the challenges, is direct air capture. Uh, so CO2 is too concentrated in the atmosphere relative to what we would like from a climate point of view, but it's not very concentrated at 400 ppm. So this is really fishing for quite rare molecules. And at the moment, it is a very energetically expensive approach. But this idea of direct air capture has a huge amount of interest because you can imagine we could actually, it's easier to picture how you could actually, uh, once you captured that CO2 in a cost effective and an energy efficient and in a truly um, uh, uh, low carbon way, once you did that, and if you chose to sequester or you chose to build this into building materials, which is if they're long lived is another form of sequestration, you can really start to imagine how you could have a beneficial impact on the net CO2 in the atmosphere. So this motivated us to pursue an approach to our research that would, again, take CO2 from some stream, would combine it with renewable low carbon electricity from one of the sources I mentioned today or another, from hydro, from nuclear, uh, and water, or proton source, and focus on the technology to electrochemically reduce the CO2 into uh, fuel, thereby closing a loop, or potentially into a chemical that could make it into a long-lived material uh, in order to uh, fully lever this increasing abundance of electricity. Uh, the technologies to do this are, I mean, of course, the basics are known. These are electrolyzers. And the field of water splitting electrolyzers to make hydrogen has seen tremendous advancements. It's got more work to do and it's got remaining challenges, but it's certainly uh, way ahead and it's uh, shown some very compelling results. We would focus instead on CO2 electrolyzers where in a system with you know, fairly strong analogies, uh, we would perform on a cathode electrochemical reduction of CO2 to say uh, a fuel, uh, or a fuel precursor. And on the anodic side, initially we'd probably produce uh, oxygen through the oxygen evolution reaction. Maybe more interestingly down the road, there's a lot of reactions that occur in industry that desire oxidation. Uh, a lot of ethylene becomes ethylene oxide and a lot of propylene becomes propylene oxide or propylene glycol. So there are a lot of oxidation reactions that we could also imagine seeking to pair this with. Now, one of the challenges that we and the whole community have immediately faced is that there are many options. So CO2 can be reduced to many different possible products, ranging from C1, like carbon monoxide and formic acid, to multi-carbon, like C2s, ethylene and ethanol, and many others. And the pathways through which all these reactions happen are not completely understood. And how certain catalysts and choice of electrolytes uh, and the overall environment influence these processes are not fully understood, especially when they are electrically powered. But what we did know is that we would need to make a lot of real engineering progress. We would need the Faraday efficiency, which is the yield on electrons. So if I put 100 electrons in, how many of them go to making uh, propanol, if that's the business I'm in? So we would need to improve that yield on electrons. We would need to improve the intensity, because without further improving the intensity towards near the levels that water splitting electrolyzers work at, the capital cost of these systems would be too large. 
we would certainly need to improve energy efficiency, a component of which comes from this electron efficiency, the Faraday efficiency, but another component of which comes from the voltage efficiency. We would have to scale down the voltage to much closer to what thermodynamics mandates than where we are today. And then eventually we'd have to engage in the same crucial area of durability science to bring durable products to the market. Now, those are challenging problems and it was a tall task. Uh, at the same time, to look on the bright side, um, these are problems in material science that require multi-component materials engineering and the field of material science and nanomaterials had already given us incredible diversity of nanostructures and placing materials on supports. In fact, the field of thermocatalysis had and, and it continues to lead in this area, with, also with understanding these effects and the effects of how a nanoparticle on a support uh, behaves differently than in the wild. Shape effects, the effects of facets and confinement alloys and cores and shells. So there's incredible diversity of degrees of freedom available to us, but perhaps what was limiting was more predictability. How would the synthesis of a particular composition of a multi-component material actually drive performance? So actually the first step that we took in the field was, was to try to kind of get a stable baseline, just to be able to make uh, a CO2, in this case to ethylene, one of our kind of model molecules, a CO2 to ethylene electrolyzer that was stable just for a couple of hundred hours that achieved constant performance, uh, where we could um, make these reproducibly every time. And only once we did that would we be a in a position to then start to systematically vary the catalyst composition. So this we did on a gas diffusion electrode, something that allowed the gas phase CO2 in through the back allowed it to come into contact with a solid heterogeneous catalyst. This one's showing copper nanoparticles. And for that to be in contact with a liquid electrolyte. So really a three-phase boundary being formed between the gas and the solid and the liquid phases. And then we started to explore. So I'll give an example of one of the things we've been exploring. Uh, this idea came really from working with colleagues. Our co-authors here are Teo Agapi and Jonas Peters at Caltech. And Teo and Jonas had already done really brilliant work in understanding how to improve heterogeneous electrocatalysis and how to use molecular strategies to try to augment the efficiency of these kinds of processes. And in early computational studies together, we predicted that the way in which the carbon uh, monoxide intermediate, the CO star intermediate, on one of these catalysts, the way in which it was bound. Was it bound in one of these two possible configurations, the atop or the bridge? It looked like this could really influence the carbon-carbon coupling step. So this key step along the way to the formation of a multi-carbon, a C2 intermediate, that's along the path to ethylene. And then we asked, you know, how could we influence that? How could we influence that physical chemistry? And uh, with our colleagues, realized that if we could put a layer of organics, of molecules, right near the surface of the catalyst, near where the CO was bound, we could potentially tune the energetics. So we could really tune the environment or the interaction between the CO adsorbate and the catalyst, kind of from above. Now, Teo and Jonas and their colleagues already had remarkable abilities to do this. They had a family of n aryl pyridinium salts where they could really systematically tune the beta charge on the nitrogen group. And so we had a library at our disposal that we could go explore systematically. And what we found was that the Faraday efficiency, that electron efficiency that I described, was very strongly tuned by the selection of these molecules. And it was very strongly correlated with the experimentally measured ratio of the atop to the bound adsorbates uh, on the catalyst. And so it kind of fulfilled this idea that a, a sort of a tweaking of the environment in which the adsorbate saw itself from above was a feasible strategy. And that the molecular approach, uh, one that of course is now widely adopted and studied in homogeneous ca catalysis, could really be united with the heterogeneous approach used in electrocatalysis, many electrocatalysis works. So this we optimized together, we're able to oligomerize the best of these molecules to make a more stable platform, and we're able to achieve uh, about 190 hours of continuous operation in this enhanced performance CO2 to ethylene system. 
So I've spoken about what you do if you already have the CO2 captured. But another really interesting area that many groups are interested in is trying to figure out ways in which you could make the capture of the CO2 either from the industrial flu or from the factory that's producing ethanol or perhaps eventually from direct air capture, how you could make that proceed more efficiently, both from a energy cost perspective and also from a capital cost perspective. And the approach that we've taken is one known as reactive capture. So first I need to just highlight the legacy approach um, that, that many groups are pursuing and is now growing in its adoption and its performance, which is first to take your gas, be it air or be it flue gas, contact it to either a liquid or a solid sorbent, but then use typically thermal swing or pressure swing or vacuum swing to release that CO2 and feed that into one of these electrolyzers I've been speaking about. But that comes with quite a few inefficiencies. And so recently, this community of folks in reactive capture started to ask, could we use the liquid that captures the CO2, and which of course now has a high concentration of the CO2 within it, could we use the liquid and feed that directly into our electrolyzer? So it's called reactive capture because you're doing both steps here. You're doing the capture and release step, and you're actually taking the CO2 down the line closer to the final product, such as CO or syngas. Uh, and so recently we built systems to do this. I'm a little um, sensitive to the fact that I'm running a little long on time, so I might skip one or two. Maybe the engineering draw drawings we can skip. And we implemented it first with amines, liquid amines, that are used already in CO2 capture, especially in the flue gas application, and found that when we engineered the electrolyte, we could produce carbon monoxide which can be then further reacted downstream, uh, we could produce that with a 72% Faraday efficiency in this direct fashion electrically. So this field of electrochemical CO2 conversion also has many fascinating challenges. This is great news for the uh, undergraduate, master's, uh, doctoral student, and the postdoc out there. These systems do require further advantages, advances in their energy efficiency and their carbon efficiency. They also require work on durability science, and there's a very interesting regime in which we can explore how to make them produce more diverse chemicals. The chemical sector is diverse. There are many products we'd like to produce directly. I'll use what remains of my two minutes to just skip through a few areas we're excited about for the future. One is that both I and my students love a good translational problem. Everybody's looking to have real impact, and so we've recently participated in an XPRIZE competition where we scaled from a gram per day to the 10 kilogram per day regime, uh, a CO2 to ethylene system. Uh, we've, we basically said all bets, are, all bets are available to us in trying to accelerate the discovery of new materials for energy harvesting, like from the sun, and also for catalyst discovery. And so we've increasingly uh, started to turn not only to computational methods, which we've been using for a while, like DFT, but in fact accelerating the use of those with the aid of machine learning. So that can be done at the computational screen stage, but it can also be done at the synthesis stage, uh, the high throughput characterization phase, and then there's a lot of fascinating work to be done with actually handling this huge amount of data uh, and learning off of it and eventually guiding the next set of experiments using AI. And I'll close with just saying that while I've spoken much about sort of applied goals and targets and wide searches like in my last slide, uh, I continue to feel that understanding the scientific underpinnings of all of these processes is the other just as crucial third leg of the stool in order to advance the, this field with the alacrity that it deserves. So with that, uh, I'm really looking forward to some discussion and some Q&A and some panel, uh, but I would like to acknowledge the supporters of the work, and I'd like to thank the group that did all the work, and to thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Really eye-opening, <laughs> really exciting. Um, so, any questions from the students, audience, faculty members? I'll start it off. Uh, excellent talk. So is there any scenario where 
perovskites don't reach 20-year lifetimes and still display silicon? Hmm. Yeah, so I think there's this scenario where, oh, sorry, and still do display silicon. Yeah, yeah. so that 20-year no, number you down, hear a lot. Yeah, I was going to go down a niche route, which is they could have impact uh, right. without necessarily achieving 20-year lifetimes. But actually, you know, I said 20-year lifetimes, which is why you said 20-year lifetimes, but those are now becoming 25 and 30, right. and there's a path to 40-year lifetimes, yeah. right? And certainly when I do the analysis, and when others do the analysis, uh, more importantly, um, you know, when if, if the competition can amortize its costs over a 40-year lifetime, you basically have to be able to amortize your costs over a 40-year lifetime. Sure. So, no, I think, it's, I think it's the right goal for the big climate impact, for maybe nichier stuff and for making, you know, these beautiful windows into solar harvesters or maybe a flexible thing on your car or on your smartphone. I think there may be ways towards shorter-term impact. But I think the big climate impact uh, comes from a very uh, robust solution. Yeah. Very nice talk. I have a question about the more related to CO2 reduction reaction. Like you, you mentioned machine learning. Yeah, I do DFT calculations. But how do you think like a more fundamental research instead of the machine learning direction, such as uh, for CO2 reduction, Mark Cooper recently, last year, they show it must be cations. If no cations there, there's no CO2 reduction. This machine learning, this machine cannot that I know that. There's no way to know this so fundamental part. This must be scientists to know that. How about this very, very fundamental research to really, really know the studies of like a reaction mechanism and the active sites, this part? Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And of course, like you, I'm a huge fan of Mark Koper. And, uh, and I'll just add that Mark, as you said, has some great works on cation effects uh, in the last uh, even just year. And um, We've also been, you know, I didn't, didn't mention it, I guess, because I wasn't getting into all the details, but in the work where I was describing the direct use of the CO2 captured is to the amines, you know, when we tried that first with our regular electrolyte, we got absolutely nothing. And then when we started to change the electrolyte and we started to think about, think fundamentally like you're suggesting, about the electrochemical double layer and the fact that in MEA solution, um, the... Uh, uh, cations, the large organic cations, are actually blocking the double layer, and they're getting in the way of our ability to reduce uh, the carbamate. Uh, only when we started to think that way, and only when we started to add potassium cations at high concentrations, were we able to interact uh, with the carbamate bound to the amines. So I agree with you. You couldn't sort of uh, do a wide DFT screen of a catalyst and reach these kinds of answers because that's actually not where the problem was. And so, you know, in our work, it was done more experimentally. We, we used electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to see where we were getting blocked and where we were failing to interact uh, with the anions. Um, but I, I tend to agree with you that there's always going to be a place for deep science, deep mechanistic investigation, including posing curiosity-driven questions early, like that we don't, questions we don't know already that we actually need to know the answer to that to solve some problem, but we just need to build up the basic knowledge because all of that comes in handy at some point. You just don't know when. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe next. Uh, hi, so I recently read a paper uh, on single atom catalyst. You doped different metals um, on a, uh, the copper surface. So in that paper, there's an experimental and theoretical proof that um, the iron-doped copper gives higher selectivity to methane. So did you start with the experiments or like did you start with DFT calculations uh, for that research paper? Uh, yeah, you know, in general, actually, we tend to be a little bit iterative on that. And so we're fortunate that in our research group there's people like Sam Fu Hung, who was the first author of that paper, who have a remarkable chemical intuition about what might be effective, and you know, who was thinking about how the doping with the iron could potentially influence the energetics of the key intermediates on the surface in just the right way to produce more methane, which is what Sung Fu was after in that work. And so there's people like Sung Fu, but then they do wander over to the cube of their colleague and they say, 
you know, could you screen a bunch of candidate dopants? And they sort of try these out and they see, you know, whether it looks like they're having the modulating effect. And, um, and then somebody goes into the lab and builds some catalysts. And sometimes the ability to go make them and characterize them for performance, that's actually the fastest thing to do. I mean, that's faster than running off to the synchrotron and doing the XAS and figuring out how you're modulating the oxidation state uh, of the copper near the iron. Or it's faster than actually proving that you did make something with single atoms that stay stable with single atoms. So often that's a fairly early part of the process is, is you know, with some guidance from theory and from intuition, uh, finding a really interesting catalyst. And then often the most time-consuming part comes after that, which is what, what do you actually have how is it working? How can you learn about mechanism? And there's another iterative loop with theory there. So I've deliberately not answered your question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Because we do parallel interactive chicken synthesis and egg synthesis with like a lot of conversations between the two chefs. Uh, was it? Hello. Yeah, just one more question. Uh, that, um, so for ethylene uh, pilot plan, uh, did you use copper aluminum bimetallic for uh, in that plant? Yeah, so in that system, uh, I know what you're asking about. Um, we actually ended up using a pure copper catalyst. And the reason is that in that work, um, the best electrolyte for us to operate in was, um, well, was in an MEA system. So we didn't have a you know, very high alkalinity uh, electrolyte because we started to move in the direction of trying to manage and mitigate and reduce the carbonate formation problem. And so in that system, which had, you know, not quite our very, very top Faraday efficiency, you know, so we've, we've achieved 70, 78%, occasionally 88% Faraday, Faraday efficiencies in these systems in the extreme alkaline conditions. But in that work where the goal was scale, long lasting reliability, we had to operate for a month uh, in the field continuously, um, we worked with a, a pure copper system. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, thank you for a very nice talk because it's very optimistic and maybe we can solve the global warming problem. But the question I'd like to know is that you have all this chemical synthesis thing. I'm not a chemical engineer nor a chemist. How does this system compare in terms of efficiency to nature? Like we have chlorophyll photosynthesis that converts carbon dioxide into wood or plants. How do this uh, natural process or man-made process compare to, to nature? Well, I, I was fortunate to have lunch with one of your colleagues today, and I asked him for a reminder of the kind of overall um, solar energy to stored chemical energy efficiency going from solar to biomass. And he said roughly a tenth of a percent. And so I can now, I, I, is that, did I get that right? A roughly a tenth of a percent. And I think it varies depending on the crop we're talking about, et cetera, but let's call it that rough range. And um, so a solar cell with a 30% energy efficiency followed by an electrocatalysis system with a, let's say a target uh, 50 percent energy efficiency will have an overall efficiency that's the product of those two numbers. So it will be 30 divided by 2 or it will be 15 percent. And so it will have, you know, I guess that's two orders of magnitude. It will have two orders of magnitude higher uh, uh, energy efficiency. And in my head actually one of the crucial things that that provides is actually just better land use. And because I recognize that with biology you can kind of spread out and you can consume a lot of land, but if you're looking at it from the point of view of a, uh, a land use efficiency, and land is a finite resource and there are competing uses for it, such as agriculture is a, a good example of one, um, if you can achieve a two orders of magnitude higher overall energy efficiency in one of these technological strategies or sort of artificial strategies, uh, then you'll be able to leave more land available for some of the other uses that we have for it. Uh, hi. Uh, I had a question about the perovskite uh, solar cells. So it seems like the, it looks like the best way to get high efficiencies further is through the tandem cells, right? Perovskite, perovskite, or perovskite silicon. So if, if we take that as, as the way from, like, if you want to do computational screening, you know, high throughput, you know, DFT-based approaches, 
uh, should we be modifying our search criterion in, in, in a certain way to suit like tandem solar cells better? And like, you know, a related question would be, which features or properties would you be looking for? Like, you know, defect tolerance, stability, band gap, you know, lattice matching, I don't know. What, what else are we missing there? Yeah, it's a great question. So, and the answer actually depends on which of the layers in the tandem we're thinking of. So the tandem, of course, consists of a high band gap and a low band gap um, material. The high band gap materials today have been mostly made by mixing halides, so um, combining a bromide and an iodide. But those have been introducing the challenges of um, phase kind of resegregation into a bromine-rich phase and an iodide-rich phase. And so if you're in the computational business, if you can help us crack this problem of either finding a high band gap absorber that doesn't rely on the mixed halides or uh, a mixed halide absorber that remains stable over extended operating periods at higher temperatures, that would be very impactful for the field. Uh, the uh, low band gap material used in tandems today is a lead tin mix. And uh, the tin introduces sort of an, a novel problem, if you like, which is that it's notoriously hard to control its oxidation state. And so kind of analogous answer, if you could help us discover a solution here that either didn't rely on tin, or if you could help us discover strategies uh, that truly stabilized in a long-term way the mixed lead tin materials and the oxidation states of those systems, while keeping all the other good qualities that we like, because the efficiencies, the diffusion lengths are quite nice, um, that would be a very valuable contribution for the field as well. Any questions from students or from online audience? There's a few folks over oh, there, let's hand. Um, so you mentioned machine learning and AI as being one of the tools um, for kind of technological development. Um, because this is kind of, I guess, a sort of new tool in this area, how do you see the introduction of this into academia-based research or industry-based research? And then how do you see kind of like the long-term synergy, I suppose, between machine learning and then experimental research? Yeah, I love, your, I love your question. So actually for us, we'd sort of formulated the desire to see if we could accelerate some of our discovery with machine learning. But we hadn't made too much progress. And one of the issues, this is, I'm in sort of 2020 here early, and one of the issues is that a lot of people in my group, while very talented and brilliant, didn't necessarily have the training you know, in all of the background areas that would enable them to do even kind of basic available machine learning. And then the pandemic hit. And people started offering boot camps to one another. So there were a few people who had a CS and a CE background in the group. They started offering boot camps to one another where they'd take a week all online and kind of just do introduction to machine learning with a very sort of pragmatic bent. Um, that allowed us to sort of get going on our research in the area. And actually, the boot camps themselves ended up being kind of recyclable because we eventually ended up developing an industry consortium that was sponsoring research in using machine learning to accelerate this catalyst discovery. Um, but it turns out our industry partners had an appetite for the boot camps as well. So they could start to engage with the data and roll up their sleeves. So I, I will say this was kind of a reminder for me. Uh, I guess one shouldn't need the reminder, but it's sort of a reminder that research and graduate education are like intermittently intermingled with one another and that nobody actually does pure research. And one of the reasons why uh, why universities have such a competitive advantage in doing great research is the fact that we're bringing in these doctoral students who are at the stage where they're still learning and they can absorb new things and they can develop new techniques and they can combine them with other techniques um, the way folks who are a little further along into their careers might find hard to do. So to me, it was a lesson in the, in the agility of the graduate student in picking up things like machine learning and running with them. Thank you. One last question. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a more broader question. Uh, so you have two main uh, thrusts in your research. One is kind of more like uh, preparing for the future, creating less carbon emissions. Another is more about cleaning up the mess that we've made, car capturing carbons and like maintaining the current structure that we have. But always a, as a researcher, it's always a question whether these new emerging technologies can really penetrate into the industry. And really, industries are really capital efficient. They're very 
uh, they're very rigid in a way that they want to maintain their current systems. So comparing these two technologies from your perspective as you've done research on both uh, directions, uh, what do you think is, in terms of time frame or capital efficiency, which technology do you think, among the two, are more closer to industry adoption? And what do you think are the main challenges that, that we would, that the one of the main challenges that we need to overcome for either to uh, penetrate into the industry more successfully? Yeah, thanks for the great question. There are two um, pretty distinct ones in that the solar is already an established and rapidly growing industry. It's a large industry. And um, if we can have the kind of impact that we aspire to have, I think we could potentially make that impact within the five to 10 year time frame in that area. Um, the CCUS is uh, less advanced, the solutions are less advanced, and of course while there are, there's a hydrocarbon industry that's huge, um, the industry for utilizing CO2 and transforming it uh, is less mature. I mean there are actually some niche applications for it, but certainly not turning it into, for today, and turning it into fuels and chemicals and feedstocks. Um, so I think that one's further out. Maybe that's one on the 10 or 15 or 20 year time scale. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think the critical issues in, in the areas, um, my ranking always does start with further progress and performance. Until we have the performance that's required to meet requirements, it always starts with performance. But then I would say the durability science and then the development of the mechanistic picture that we've discussed a few times now are very high priorities for both fields as well. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions and answers. Uh, so let's end the session now and thank the speaker, distinguished speaker again. Thank you.